Good morning, Chairman Raskin and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about the ongoing crisis of anti-democracy extremism and white nationalism currently present in this country. I commend you for using this forum to address the urgent threats posed to American democracy. White nationalists and other bigoted groups are driving harassment campaigns against elected officials, law enforcement, leaders of color, the LGBTQ community, school officials, and many more at an alarming rate. This harassment has a chilling effect on the ability of many people to engage in civil society. But I believe that despite an acceleration in anti-democracy formations, it is possible to build a shared commitment to a country where elected officials, business, nonprofit institutions, faith leaders, and ordinary citizens join together and reject the violence and anti-Semitic conspiracies of white nationalism and begin the important work of closing the door to political violence and stopping anti-democracy extremists from mainstreaming their tactics and agenda. I live and work in the Pacific Northwest, a place deeply shaped and impacted by anti-democracy extremism. This region has been a proving ground for extremist and anti-democracy formations. Over these past five years, as the fight for inclusive democracy has become both a national and international commitment, it becomes imperative that we soberly assess the drivers of these threats and invest in the communities and local governments who are working to combat them. First, it is important to understand that the insurrection did not end on January 6, 2021. Across the country, in small communities and towns, the insurrection is still a daily reality for many Americans, health workers, educators, local government officials, civil rights activists, election workers, and community leaders are the targets. They are bearing the brunt of intimidation, physical violence, and acts of domestic terrorism from those who were supportive or took part in the insurrection. Perhaps no incident illustrating the continuity of January 6 is better covered than the violent assault on House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband, Paul Pelosi, in October. The attacker stands accused of promoting anti-Semitic and racist language and conspiracy theories. This incident brings home the crisis for those communities that are being targeted in much the same way, but without the benefit of federal intention and mainstream media attention. It is also demonstrated that the cultural shift that has occurred in the almost two years since the insurrection, a shift to an environment where individuals feel empowered to carry out political violence on their own or in an increasingly unpredictable way. The reports of attacks on electrical infrastructure in North Carolina, Oregon, and Washington are raising the stakes. Law enforcement is reportedly investigating posts by extremists on online forums that encourage attacks on critical infrastructure. Whether the North Carolina attack was intended to disrupt the local LGBTQ event, this after a series of attacks on the LGBT community in recent weeks and months. Much of the violence and intimidation I've been describing is perpetrated by those who have been influenced by the Great Replacement, a genocidal conspiracy theory belief that is grounded in anti-Semitism. It falsely purports that global forces orchestrated a master plan to undermine white political power and white existence. Depending on the version of the theory one comes across, the conspiracy might be run by global elites or an international cabal, moneyed interest, all thinly veiled references to Jewish people. This is anti-Semitism in its most modern form, and it is a form of racism. It places Jews not as a religious other, but as a racialized other. If we seek to counter domestic extremism, we must recognize that anti-Semitism and the great replacement theory remain the energizing principle behind white nationalism. With the federal government's help, local governments and communities can respond with strategies that strengthen democratic practice while closing the space for political and hate violence. Respectfully, I offer three actions that could reduce the threat to local communities 
from anti-democracy extremism. One, block grants to counter the impacts of extremism on local governments. Two, require federal agencies to provide respective action plans. And three, root out extremism in law enforcement and the military. We remain inspired by the broad coalitions of local elected leaders, civil servants, and community members who raise their voices against violence and bigotry every day. Thank you for your time and attention.